Welcome to This Week in Hearing. My name is Amin Amlani, and I have the privilege of serving as your host. For today's webcast, I have the privilege of having discussions with two notable and well-respected international colleagues as we consider hearing products, traditional and evolving changes in service delivery, and consumer perception and experiences as they seek to improve their quality of life. Please welcome Jeff Cooling and Steve Claridge, they're co-founders of HearingAidKnown.com and Audiology Engine. They're both writers and hearing care bloggers. So welcome, gentlemen. So, but the most recent one, I think, that's really, I suppose, captured my imagination is the Lexi Hearing from HearX. That's right. And uh, that's, that, that's really, oh, that really, it's blown me away, right? Not necessarily because of the hearing aid. The hearing aid is made by Intracon. You know, it's kind of a, a basic hearing aid. Offers directionality, offers noise reduction. There's their self fit. We I checked the fit on them, and the fit is okay through the self fit app. But what really, I suppose, blew me away about Lexi Hearing was the delivery and the aftercare and the gamification of wearing their hearing aids uh, and that really struck me and I, I thought to myself I remember going through it and going through that experience and thinking to myself like we don't onboard new users the way Lexi here onboards new users like we we, <laughs> we have a lot to learn from Lexi here in relation to onboarding new users in relation to the consumer experience in in what you you know, what you'd call it, a, an omni-channel manner. And that's kind of what really blew me away about Lexi Hearing. But Lexi Hearing, for me, isn't necessarily about the product, right? The product, as I said, it's bog standard, it's okay. What really fascinates me is Lexi Hearing as a platform for moving forward. Because in essence, Lexi, in essence, HearX have built a platform that would allow them to sell any hearing aid direct to a consumer and deliver a consumer experience that's outstanding. And that's what really fascinated me about Lexi here. Yeah. Steve, have you tried the Lexi devices? I did. I mean, they, they sent me one and, and I agree with everything Jeff just said. I love the whole, you know, the box and the, the measurement uh, piece of cardboard to go over the ear to get the wire right. And the, the documentation was straightforward. The app was great, but uh, I've got a severe loss now. So I was outside the fitting range. So I could I could look how the package, you know, how it works as a package, but I couldn't actually uh, sure. test. Poor Steve is always at the window looking in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, there's all these great OTC products and stuff coming out, but I'm just, you know, I'm outside the fitting range of most of them, really. I think, you know, what you were saying, uh, asking before about the, you know, where, where the uh, OTC, which are as good as the lower level hearing aids, how that would play out. I think, you know, once, if, once people become more aware of what's, what's on the market and how they, the differences between them, then, then they'll make those choices themselves, I think. So, yeah, I mean, if the lower level tech of, say, a, a phone app was the same as, a, you know, an ego or something that somebody could just pick off the shelf, you would have to think that people would choose the, the off the shelf one over having to go and see a professional and, you know, spend time and multiple uh, appointments and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it just, you know, more, more, um, more knowledge from the consumer would, you know, make them uh, make the informed choice. Yeah. And, and, and what's interesting is, is the, the whole conversation about service. Cause I think that's, that's to me, that's a really important piece. If for example, and I have not seen the Lexi box, I don't have one uh, yet. I'm hoping, uh, Maybe they'll see this thing and send me a set. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, I think the customer service has a lot to do with whether or not someone adopts the product. And I, and I will, I, I'm really convinced of that more and more as I've, I've looked at this and, and as, as research is starting to come out. And, you know, as you pointed out with the Lexi product, you don't have a, a, a provider there over your shoulder they're using, you know, customer service, they're using the internet, they're using all these other tools. 
you have these self-fit devices that have these other tools that are available to it. And, and the market is now moving in that direction. And so the question now becomes, providers are going to have to change. As Jeff pointed out, you know, the, the one trick pony that we've had for 50 years is no longer going to work. And they're going to have to evolve into, I, I, I'll use this term, it's not a favorite of mine, patient-centered care, which is nothing more than customer service, and improve that model. And so I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on what the provider can do to now start to compete with this gamification and these other things that these technology companies are starting to penetrate the market with. Well, I think, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to get to the point where there's no practices, there's no professionals. You know, there's always going to be the need for you guys. There's always going to be people that can't self-fit, aren't so tech savvy, or just like, you know, like Jeff said, some people have got, you know, it takes them longer just to get used to to hearing aids, the whole processing issues and whatever. So, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be a place for practices without a question. But for me, it's just about options, really. I mean, at the moment, so, yeah, you know, the, these OTC devices are starting to come out. But up until recently, the only option really was to go in, uh, see a professional and go through that whole process. And wow. I think, you know, that people just don't want to do that for, for various reasons. You know, money, the cost is one thing, but just, you know, it's just you've, you've got to take time off work to go and visit. Uh, and, you know, they, the whole sort of medical um, angle to it kind of puts people off because they don't want to feel like they've got a disability, they've got a problem that needs correcting. So there's definitely a place for practices. Uh, It's difficult, to be honest, it's difficult for me to see how you could compete with an OTC product that sits on a shelf in a box with good enough onboarding app and a self-fit that is pretty much, well, it's never going to be as good as a professional, uh, you know, set of hearing tests. You know, REMs are always going to be difficult, probably, in a, inside a box. But, I mean, so with that box model, if somebody goes into the shop, buys it, and um, puts it in, and they say, yeah, this is quite good. I'm reasonably happy with it. But, you know, this one thing is just annoying me. When water hits a metal sink, it's too loud, or a door slams too loud, or I can't hear ladies' voices. They've got that little problem. So, you know, teleaudiology is becoming, uh, should, I think, be becoming much more of a bigger thing than it is. You know, the providers are given that option on the app, but from what I gather from my people, they're still not really getting picked up that much. So definitely, I think, you know, if I was a professional now, I think I would probably be advertising teleaudiology and saying that if you've got a problem with your hearing aids, get in touch, we'll Zoom. Obviously, there's going to be connectivity issues, but, you know, providing that service so they can just, you know, contact you, book you for an hour, you can fix their problem for them over the phone. Um, so, yeah, I think that could definitely be, you know, people wouldn't necessarily have to come in and see you, but they could just, uh, you know, book you for an hour, uh, however much your hourly rate is, and you fix that specific problem for them that the software can't fix. So, yeah, I think I, de- I definitely see a future where there's fewer practices, but there's still going to be plenty out there. So, you know, I think I don't think it's just going to destroy the industry. I think it's going to be a lot fewer, but I think, you know, the the, the, uh, the best the best practices will keep going and, uh, you know, the people that just kind of find the end at the moment and don't do such a good job are probably not going to be in business much longer. From my, pers- from my perspective, I think that, so I think there's a couple of things and I want to address a couple of things that Steve has said. So one is the medicalization of hearing loss. Okay. So Steve said there, you know, the whole medical model in relation to, you know, going to a clinic, blah, 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 and handicap or disability. Okay, and and that's one of one of the things that I've been thinking about quite lately is in relation to and I, I wrote an article about it in relation to what what we best describe as simple sensory neural hearing loss, which I feel is what I have. Okay, so I have simple sensory neural hearing loss. Yes, it's noise and juice, uh, but do I is that a medical problem? Okay, is that a medical problem? Do I need to go to a hospital set or a clinical set to have that dealt with? Should I have to go to a clinical set to have that dealt with? Right. And so from my perspective, the answer is no. I, I that or I don't think I have to. For instance, I believe if that if there's a product ready, if there's a product available to me that I can you know, kind of like self-program and, and get on with and it provides the support that I need, why shouldn't I follow that model? 
why should I not, or why should I be forced into a medical process, right? So that's so that's one of the things that I want to address in relation to what Steve has said, right? Is simple sensory neural loss a medical problem, okay? But it, it also brings me on to, you know, the, the question that you asked, right? How will we, as a profession, live in this in this new setting, okay? And I think that there's, there's possibly two options for us moving forward. The first option is do as we've always done and do it, as Steve has said, okay? So there'll be premium audiologists, premium independents. We know who they are. They're already in the marketplace right now, and they're doing exceptionally well. And there will be all of the others who aren't really offering anything apart from great service. <laughs> 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 Yeah, great service. <laughs> Let's not discuss that. We won't dwell on that. Right? So, and and I think that's one way. That's one way we can go. The other way possibly is okay. You said, how do we compete, right? And and I feel that actually offering those devices, moving forward with those devices, like the Lexi hearing device, or or a new hearing device, or Anything else that comes out that's aimed at that basically marketplace that we haven't actually penetrated at all, right? Uh, providing those devices will allow us to become relevant to those people. If, if we don't provide those devices, if we try to ignore those devices and we pretend that they don't exist or we poo-poo them or whatever, I think that we as a profession will lose our relevance to the people use those devices. and it goes beyond just so we're you know we're focused on hearing devices right naturally okay but there's there's a whole customized audio world out there beginning from headphones to televisions to settings on your laptop to it's just endless this idea of customized audio that's been that's been made available right now to consumers right and and those consumers are going to evolve and mature with this idea of customized audio in an in an easy and simplistic manner more or less right and then if if we're not relevant to those people they won't look to us as they realize that the customization of the audio that needs to be delivered needs to take the next step towards, you know, proper hearing aids or hearing care moving forward and why that's important. That's one of the things that we kind of need to realise that if we're not relevant to, to consumers right now, we won't be relevant to them in the future when they're ready to make a jump to, I suppose, what we call traditional hearing aids or traditional hearing care. And I think that's really important for us to realize. I think if we do that, I don't see the death knell for <laughs> the wider audiology profession. I think if we don't do that, I think that the audiology profession will, in essence, become a clinical profession that's focused on clinical needs and very complex needs. <laughs> in essence, a hospital profession. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And, and you had a wonderful blog. I guess it was a month or two ago that that kind of addressed a lot of these these issues that you're talking about. Yeah, I I think that I think that for for us as a profession, because you know I'm in a unique position, I'm a user and a, and a profession. But I think for us as a as a profession, we've people within the profession are like, oh, have we seen it all before? But you haven't, you haven't seen this before. You know, you haven't seen this kind of like a uh, meeting of customized audio and, and ever burgeoning uh, marketplace of devices that are actually all uh, right available to consumers in a in a direct manner so one of the things i did recently was with the active pro from signia okay so i wanted to test the ai on the app right so I fitted the Signi Active Pro in my with my hair loss and played with it for a week. And then I cleared it, set it to like a flat 40 kind of thing. 
okay, shoved her in my ear and used the assistant to find you. All right, so too basic, not clear enough, too basic, not clear enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And through the assistant, I was kind of able to get the amplification within the ballpark of what I needed when I checked it on card. Okay, so I didn't write it up because I thought <laughs> that frightened the Jesus out of me. <laughs> but that's what I was able to do. And that's what I mean about you. You haven't seen this technology before. You know, even the bow stuff, people laughed at the bow stuff. And, and that's fine. I understand that. You know, the bow hearing aids are, are basic hearing aids. Nothing surprising about them. Not necessarily hugely innovative about them. However, they're both, and consumers recognize that. Not only that, and this is fascinating, right? Both have said, you know, you buy these, you buy the receiver. Oh, by the way, you'll probably have to replace the receiver once a year, and it's chargeable. Right? Many hearing aid manufacturers say that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, so, I mean, there's this whole, like, it's it's funny how these non-traditional uh, providers or these non-traditional manufacturers have, have kind of entered the marketplace and said, you provide receivers every, for up to two years because they fill them with wax. Are you mad? We're not going to do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think, like, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Go on. So I was just going to say, I think, you know, what you said there about the, the basically the self-fitting app with the AI that got you back to pretty much where you needed to be. I think that that's the key. That's the end game for me. You know, what I want to see ultimately is, you know, the latest from Widex, Phone App, Ocon, GM on a shelf, be it in a specialist hearing uh, shop or, you know, Walgreens or whatever, uh, with an app like that which might not get you 100%, you know, professionally fitted as if you would uh, if you were using REMS. But I honestly believe, you know, software has got to the point where it can get you to something that's easily good enough for people to be able to operate in every day, you know, to go about their lives here and better, which is ultimately what they want. You know, they're not probably not interested in being perfectly fitted 100%. You know, if it's, it's 98%, right? probably good enough and i think you know that people could release apps now with that kind of onboarding helper uh technology to do that and you know and also you know ultimately you know the other big part of the puzzle is just the feedback so at the moment somebody comes into your practice two weeks really happy with them but i've got these five problems and you go you go to your, to your programming software and, and change it, you know, what do you think? Is that better, or worse? You know, and you try and work through those problems. So there's no reason why the app couldn't be have like a sort of um, what do you call it, like a virtual assistant kind of thing that walks you through. So there's got to be you know typical problems. I can't hear my daughter, or I, you know, slamming the door slams too loud. It's got to be, and so the app would say, "Is the door too loud?" Yes. Okay. What does it sound like right now? Oh, that's much better. Thanks. So the feedback loop is much quicker. So you don't have to wait to go to the practice and get an appointment in two weeks' time. You, the app goes, is the door slam too loud? Yeah, try that. Oh, that's much better. Nice one. So I, I do think we're getting really close to the point where software can fix. Software can have all your knowledge in it. It can take all your years of audiology experience, package that into some smart uh, software that answers those questions for a lot of people, not everybody, of course, you know, it's not going to work 100% across the board and make everybody redundant. But I do think there's a huge customer base out there who aren't coming into practices for whatever reasons who would do, you know, really well with that kind of, you know, a great hearing aid, buy a great hearing aid off the shelf, couple it with software that's smart, can fit it quite well, and away they go. And then if they're not happy, they book, it, book you for an hour or two, so you can fix it for them. It seems just like a perfect solution to me. I think it's interesting, you know, what Steve says about, you know, solutions. I've talked about, you know, the $300 problem, not the $3,000 problem. You know, and I've, I've talked about that quite a bit, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think that's for, it, 
all these devices, the new hair device, especially the you know, um, the wear and hair device to a certain extent, the all a pro device, uh, these type of devices kind of like, um, are attractive to the people who feel they have a $300 problem or a $400 problem, right? You know, they don't feel they have a three grand problem. And they don't feel that they have a handicap, a disability, right? And, but yes, we, our profession, in, in essence, forces them into that, that kind of model. You know, it forces them into that. You have a disability. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, like and many of us are aware we have disabilities. We're eminently aware our wives tell us. Right, <laughs> but, but our hearing might not be what we feel is one of our disabilities, right? Right. So, I mean, there's got to be a for for me, there's got to be like a middle ground. There's got to be a way for us to appeal to those people, right? Without, in essence, enforcing this medical model, right? Uh, and these type of devices are, 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 I think, kind of like an ideal way to solve their problems because they do have problems right they they wouldn't be looking for some sort of support in noisy situations if they didn't have a problem right so you know to solve those problems to be relevant to them and also to help them through the world okay that that moves on to perhaps traditional hearing aids but like even now if if you think about it and I don't think this is an outrageous statement Right. In 10 years time, OK, there may not be what we recognize as a traditional hearing aid. You mm-hmm. know, the, the technology and the innovation is moving so fast that hearing devices as such may not be recognizable in the future in, in relation to what they are now and how we're involved with them now. So, so yeah, like it's it's. There's a whole lot going on, and there's a whole lot for us in the profession to think about. I'm not, I'm not afraid of it. I, I enjoy it, and and that's what I mean about. And I said it earlier, this schizophrenia. <laughs> you know, as a consumer, I'm like, ah! <laughs> as a professional, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but you know, it, it's uh, for me, it's wondrous. This, this evolution in technology, and particularly in relation to how, say, Widex is using it. Steve was talking there about the door slamming, you know, stuff like that. And, and in essence, Widex was probably one of the first companies to introduce that with their machine learning. Signia have expanded on that with their kind of system. If most of the other manufacturers will introduce that. And, you know, fine tuning moving forward as we know it, it's already reduced somewhat because, as we were saying earlier on, the bulk of higher technology here now it's really help the bulk of consumers, right? So you fit them well, you ram them. Yes, you might have to do some customization after you ram them, okay, for their specific needs. And then you set them free in the wild. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, they're, they're happy, right? So it, it feels like already... The amount of fine tuning that we once had to do as professionals has reduced dramatically. Okay, if AI or machine learning will reduce that even more, or actually be used for a, a really interesting or really good forced self fit. Okay, w- what's our justification for being then moving forward if we're all about selling here next? So that's that's one of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about because it, our justification moving forward would be the complex case. Uh, I, I think I think the industry. I don't I don't see the you know it's it's a it's a medical industry up till now, but I, I don't re- don't really see it that way at all. I think you know hearing aids are electronic consumer devices like an iPad or the laptop that I bought you know, you know a few weeks back, and so and I, I, I think I don't see why we can't. Uh, service those like say you know if my car if there's a problem with my car I might be able to fix it myself 
not particularly good for you know that mechanics, but I might be able to fix it. So I could try and fix it. If I don't, I go and hire somebody and pay them for a couple of hours to, you know, they quote me, oh yeah, that looks like it's a three hour job. Okay, thanks. And I take it in and get it done. I don't I don't buy into a whole, you know, five thousand pound three year relationship with the guy at the garage. I just wanted to fix my car. And I, I kind of just see here and aids in the same way. I mean I understand this whole, you know, there's a lot of problems that we're you know, people being able to get used to hearing these, of course there is, but I don't see why we have to stick with that existing model of the big payment up front and the whole relationship kind of thing. Of course, some people want that, but it doesn't have to be the only way, I don't think. You know, if, I'm, if I've got a problem, just fix it for me, yeah? And then <laughs> that's it. I'll see you later. I don't, I don't need any more than that. And I, I think that's, I mean, is that's one of the things that we haven't delivered as a profession, right? In essence... You know, myself and Steve talked about this just recently, about a month or two ago. In essence, Steve is paying, okay, a lot of money to support somebody else's hearing care journey, okay? Because Steve isn't accessing that hearing care journey. Steve is, Steve is a one and done fit almost, okay? So, okay, it's not that easy, right? But Steve is almost the one and done fit. And he might turn up two or three times over a five-year period for possibly some fine tuning, but probably some service need, right? So why is Steve paying three and a half grand for a set of top of the range tier names, or four grand for a set of top of the range tier names, right? When he's by no means using four grand's worth of services. And and in essence, right, the reason he's paying for He's actually supporting somebody else's children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in the States, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is move to an itemized uh, a model. Uh, the problem is, is the, you know, for the, for, the, for the provider in a bundled model, they get all their money up front and then they don't have to worry whether the person comes in like a Steve. And if you do it where it's itemized, it's, it's more of a marathon. You're getting smaller chunks. Uh, and you have to, you know, you have to continue that customer service. And uh, you know, so there's a lot of resistance towards that. So as you guys have so eloquently pointed out, the providers are going to have to change because the market is changing, the product is changing, and the patients are changing. And if they don't, you know, the cream is going to rise to the top and those people are going to be at the, at the, in the marketplace. And those that are beneath it, well, you know, I'm um, sorry, but you know, maybe there's a uh, another calling for you. And then the patients at the end of the day, as we all pointed out, they're going to penetrate the market more like we've never seen. And the hope is, is that they're able to take care of their own hearing needs in a way that fulfills the issues that they're facing. And as their hearing problems progress, they can maybe move up to the provider and the provider then can potentially help them. It's a very unique place that we're in at this point in time. Yeah, no, you know, completely agree. And, and and what you said, so first of all, what you said in relation to it was, was like as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, some people are are are, are a little bit, you know, against itemization. You know what I'm thinking? Is that because they might have to actually do some work? I mean, <laughs> tell me, is that where it is? <laughs> right. <Could be. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You better cut that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what, I think what I was, sorry, go on. What, what I was thinking was, right, that, you know, what you said about this, you know, the consumers will start to begin to look after their own solutions for their, for their problems with this complete, you know, this wider concept of customized audio i called it augmented audio right just for for want of it of an easy term right yeah and and this whole concept of augmented audio and how that fits into you know a, a burgeoning awareness of hearing loss and and getting solutions to different situational problems and then how that may evolve to you know, a hearing loss that may need to be dealt with it by a professional, right? And and it's like, it's exactly what I said earlier on. If we're not relevant at the customized 
audio stroke augmented audio for situational solutions. How will we be relevant when it comes to, you know what, these problems are uh, starting to exceed what these devices can offer? And, and that's where I go back to Lexi here. Okay. So, Lexi here. So, in the future, Lexi here and offers the 700 quid set of hearing aids. Okay. Maybe they offer a 300 set of situational devices. Okay. And then maybe they offer a $2,000 dollar set of real hearing aids. And then Lexi Hearing brings their consumers exceptionally well through a journey from the voice level to the light the voice level in that beautiful omni channel manner with real gamification of wearing the devices. Okay. If they do that Right, and they sell Phonic pop it around cheer names, or they sell resale pop it around cheer names, or they sell Sparky top of the range cheer names, or whatever. Okay, and they do that well. How will we be relevant to their customers? We we won't be. We we won't have any relevance to their consumers. I think your your expertise would still be relevant to, you know, like I said before, you know. Just you, Jeff. Just you. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be the only person. That... No, but I mean, you know, that, that years of expertise is always going to be needed. Not always, but there's going to be some people that, you know, go for that self bit. And like you said, with the signal, you know, it's good, but they might might not be perfect. So there's always going to be that the use for that knowledge and the expertise. But I just think it gets used in a different way. You know, teleaudiology, by the hour, whatever. You just, yeah. you just sell your expertise in a different way rather than getting people in for a whole, you know, five-year big, uh, big big, money outlay is uh, usually when, when we need you. Yeah. I, I think that is probably one of the most frightening things to the profession. You know, yeah. the, the, the idea of uh, having to offer metered hourly services, I think that's actually... One of the most frightening things to the profession, and 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 it's mainly because many people within the profession aren't necessarily businessmen, and they really don't understand how to work out an hourly rate and what that rate may be, and uh, and I think that's one of the fears that kind of drives that intransigence for for change. And and the one thing I'd say to to our profession, my fellow colleagues, is that. Up to now, innovation and technology within hearing aids, okay, by hearing aid manufacturers, has in essence conspired to protect our profession, okay? And and I don't mean there was a deep conspiracy or anything like that. I mean that the innovation and technology just really drove our profession as the providers, okay? Moving forward from this point, and, and that's a lie. It's not from this point. It's from two years ago. Yeah. Uh, but moving forward from this point, innovation and technology within both uh, internally within the hearing aid industry and externally within consumer audio products, right, will ensure that our profession is no longer protected as providers. And I think that's what's really important for our profession to understand implicitly so that we can decide how we will remain relevant to a consumer, a change in consumer, and how we will, I suppose, secure our place moving forward. And, and I think... And, and this is like with that split schizophrenia <laughs> that we're exceptionally important within the consumer journey. Okay. Yeah. I think up to now we haven't necessarily been consumer focused, right? 
or patient focus or patient centered or whatever the chase is you want to speak you want to call it okay but i i do think that we deliver benefits to the consumer when we're doing our job properly and well and i do believe that we are important to the future of consumers who need hearing care who need assistance with hearing loss who, who needs all who need all of those things right but i think that if we don't understand how things are changing and if we don't move to meet those changing wants and needs i think in essence we're, our, our, our profession is going to commit suicide uh, and that's my worry because as i said i do believe our profession is important uh, but for us to remain important and for us to remain relevant, we, we actually need to change. We need to address all those issues and decide what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. Good advice. Steve, any any last words of advice for providers? I was going to say, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it answers your question directly, but I think the other important thing we didn't talk about was the whole stigma around here. And also, I, mean, I know you, you kind of mentioned it earlier, um, but I think that's something else that needs addressing. And I think when we continue to be uh, a medical professional in a medical environment with medical devices, I think we're not uh, helping that stigma. You know, people are still worried about how they're perceived, uh, which is really frustrating to me because, you know, uh, so I was in London last night uh, and on the tubes on the underground, uh, you know, practically every other person had some white uh, earbuds in their ears listening to music or, or big, you know, massive headphone cans on. So people have no problem wearing things in their ears. That's not the issue. Uh, it's just the whole perception of what a hearing aid is and what that means for you. Um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely a big hurdle. That, and I think OTC and, and you know, non-medical type products will, will help that. Um, but, yeah, I think... For me personally, I think professionals could be less less medicalized <laughs> uh, and more sort of you know it's just just uh, just another purchase like a like a laptop or a, or an iPhone. I think that would that would help people be uh, you know easier and to, just to come in. I think you know I think you get more people in if they didn't if the barrier if, if they felt like they were just purchasing an electronic device with your expertise as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, you guys have been on for, for some time now, and uh, we're going to have to do this again. But next time, I'm going to get HHTM to buy me a plane ticket. I'm going to fly out to where you guys are. We can do this in a pub, and uh, we'll just record this thing until we're done. How's that? Yeah. Sounds, Sounds good, good to me. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and anything that is uh, going to get us into trouble, we'll just have to edit out so no one else can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could definitely happen. Well, guys, I really appreciate your time, and I, I'm telling you, it's been it's been an honor and a pleasure. I think the viewership is going to get a lot out of this, and like I said, uh, you know, in a year's time, I think we need to revisit this because uh, you guys have laid down some uh, some pretty interesting comments, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not they come true. Uh, and if they do, you know, J uh, Jeff is going to become my clairvoyant, you know, and I'm going to start asking him about. Uh, <laughs> Lotto numbers and all these other kinds of things, so that I can retire before I'm 60. And, and it feels like sometimes, you know, I mean, it feels like that I'm clairvoyant, but I have a five year store. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> well, gentlemen, it's been great. 